Would you please briefly pause with me to pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you for this beautiful sanctuary. Thank you for the freedom to worship you. So Lord, we are grateful for this opportunity. As we are gathered here this morning, we confess Holy Spirit of God that apart from you, we cannot understand your word or apply your word to our lives. So please minister to us this morning. Heavenly Father, this is my prayer that you would feed your people, hide your servant, and build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few months ago at SIAX, we dedicated our uh, renovated chapel. Now, this was the 25th year of the chapel. So we decided to renovate. And as the student body, the community is growing, we decided to uh, add a few more space and, uh, you know, and to upgrade it with some latest uh, AV equipments as well. Now, when the first chapel, the chapel was first built at SIAX some 25 years ago, to commemorate it, they put a plaque outside at one side of the chapel. And the plaque read that the, the chapel has been built and dedicated with the prayer that, that in the preaching of the word and the breaking of the bread, that people would be able to encounter the living God. In the preaching of the word and the breaking of the bread, that people would encounter the living God. So this time when we uh, renovated it and expanded it and to commemorate this occasion, we put another block on the other side of the church, uh, church wall. And it said the same thing, but we also consciously added one more phrase. We said that uh, in the preaching of the word and the breaking of the bread that people would encounter in the worship of the Lord, people would encounter the living Lord and be motivated for his mission and be motivated for his mission. Because if our worship does not lead us to be a witness, then I believe that there is something fundamentally suspect about our worship. True worship always leads to authentic witness for Jesus Christ. So if you come out of a chapel, when you next time come there, please visit us. When you come out of a chapel uh, in the right, in the portico, you would see this big wall and we have a big world map. And as people come out of the chapel, you have this big map of the world and underneath it's written, go and make disciples of all nations. So when I heard that these four weeks you are focusing on the Great Commission, I was so delighted uh, to know about it. And then I was told that you've been looking at it from uh, different uh, angles and perspectives. And I think you have uh, had already looked at the magnitude of the Great Commission and uh, the method of the Great Commission. And this week we are going to look at the message. And God willing, next week uh, you're going to hear the means of the Great Commission, right? So what we do today is to look at the message of the Great Commission. What is the central message of the Great Commission? Of course, the passage that was given to me, uh, uh, that was read by Max here, uh, Luke chapter 24, uh, Luke chapter uh, 24, right towards the very end from verse 45 onwards. Okay, it was read from 46, but I would add 45 as well. Verse 45 onwards. Interestingly, the Great Commission passage, which we often, you know, there is no term called Great Commission in the New Testament, okay? Uh, there is no way it's written as Great Commission. Uh, but the Great Commission is often, uh, you know, focused upon Matthew chapter 28. But if you notice, every single gospel has a Great Commission thrust towards the end of the gospel. You read that in Mark chapter 16, you read that here in Luke 24, you read that in John chapter 20, and of course you also read that in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 8. So this Luke inversion of the Great Commission is what we would briefly look this morning uh, from verse 45 onwards. Let me quickly read verse 45 onwards. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures he told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, 
and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. What is the message? What is the message of the Great Commission? What is the message of the gospel? Right often when we talk about gospel, what is the central message of gospel? As you see here, as you see throughout the scriptures, uh, I think we all know that, that gospel is Jesus Christ, right? Gospel is Jesus Christ or the incarnate word. word. I want to briefly speak about four components of this message, okay, because uh, so I would, uh, but I would stay probably a little more time in the first one, the incarnate word, right? Gospel is Jesus Christ. Now, you notice here that, uh, that this is what Jesus is telling that this should be preached, and uh, he's telling that, that Christ will suffer, right? He talks about how the Messiah will come, he would suffer, he would rise again, and then the gospel or this good news would be preached to all nations so that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be offered to all nations. So this incarnate word... That Jesus Christ is the central message of the Great Commission. Right? This is what Paul wrote, you know, at the time when there was so much false teachers and false teaching that was swamping, that was swarming the, the church in Corinth. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, this is what I passed on to you as first importance in verse 3. He said, but in verse 1, he said, this is the gospel I received and this is the gospel I preached to you. It is the gospel you have trusted and you are saved by this gospel. And then in verse 3 he says that, that Christ suffered according to the scripture. He died and then he rose again according to the scripture and then he was seen by apostles and by others. In other words, Paul is saying that this is the crux of the gospel that is Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, the incarnate word. But in Luke 24, what are the aspects of Jesus that we are able to see as you look at the incarnate word as the main thrust of the gospel? Uh, you look here, he says that, uh, it starts by saying that Christ will suffer. In some uh, version, it says the Messiah will suffer, right? The Messiah will suffer. So when you look at the incarnate word, the first thing you notice is that this is an eternal word, eternal word. Because sometimes some Christians believe that because we talk about Jesus as the incarnation of God, as if Jesus came into being only when he appeared some 2,000 years ago in Palestine. But the Bible teaches clearly, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So this is the eternal word, and this eternal word has come as the incarnate word into the world. And that is the good news that, the, that has been entrusted, not just to the apostles, but to the whole church. This incarnate word is eternal, and then you notice what here. It is also historic, right? This Jesus is historic. You not only talk about Jesus as the eternal incarnate word, but also historic, that he came into the world, right? In a specific time, in a specific form, and he died and he rose again, okay? So this eternal word is also the historic word. And then you notice what we read, that this is also the salvific word, that only in the name of Jesus, right, we hear that, that in the name of Jesus, forgiveness of sin will be preached. That's why much later on, Peter would say in Acts 4.12, that there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved, right? Salvation is found in no one else except in the name of Jesus Christ. So this word, this incarnate word is also salvific, that only when we put our trust in this word, you and I are saved. And fourthly, as you look at this incarnate word, what does it do? It's also transformative. As Jesus came into the world and as you believe in Jesus, not only are sins are forgiven, 
but we are transformed. You know, often we stop with that. Oh, I believe in Jesus, my sins are forgiven. But the good news is our lives are being transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. That's why towards the end he will say, you are witnesses, right? You are witnesses. They are being transformed to be a witness for Jesus Christ. The incarnate word, that is the central thrust of the, the gospel. Why do I believe this is very important? Because sometimes we can do so many things. Right? The church can do so many things and we can talk a lot about several things, but we might miss out on the central thrust of the gospel. That is Jesus Christ. Remember the shepherds who were uh, you know, uh, taking care of their sheep in Luke chapter 2? And then a great company of angels would come and they would, they would announce this good news. What do they say? Behold, I bring good news of great joy to all the people. I follow this carefully. Right? Good news is what gospel is. Behold, I bring good news of great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born for you. What is good news? That is good news. The angel said, this is good news, and this is a glad news, and this is a global news. So you read throughout the gospel, there's so much emphasis on all nations, to all people, to every creature. Because this is a good news for all the people, for all the people. I wonder sometimes how much we and the church as such has, 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 has grasped this truth that the centrality of our faith is Jesus himself. Is Jesus himself. That's the crux of our faith. Someday we can do so many things and yet forget what is the good news. Jim Baker was a man who was the pioneer in tele-evangelism way back in the late 70s and early 90s, uh, early 80s. He was the most popular tele-evangelist in America, probably in the whole world. He had his base in Charlotte, America in North Carolina. And uh, he had massive property, huge properties. Uh, he had a ministry called Praise the Lord Ministry, and he had several retreat centers, and he had a big studio from which, you know, the, he would preach the word. Jim Baker's ministry went on at the peak of his ministry. He had some 3,000 people working for him with an annual payroll, payroll of 30 million U.S. dollar. Now, this was 40 years ago. Yet somehow, somewhere, as ministry went on, as the Lord prospered the work, this man of God's eyes began to move away from the central thrust that is Jesus Christ. And he began to, you know, go in a different direction. Soon he fell into sin, he, 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 he fell into adultery, he fell into several other uh, sins, and then finally he was caught up by the government, and he was charged for tax fraud, and he was sentenced for 45 years in prison. There in the lonely prison cell, Jim Baker began to ponder over his life, what had happened to me? Here I was, one of the most foremost tele-evangelists of my time, but what has happened to me? Why am I in this prison cell? So he began to reflect on his life and put it into writing. And he came out with a book. If you get that book, please, you read that book, it will be very beneficial. The title of the book was, I Was Wrong, okay? I Was Wrong. And he talked about various things, you know, that led him away, prosperity, gospel, and several other things that led him away from the Lord. But one, one interesting phrase really got my attention, where he said that how early on in his ministry, when, when, when we saw his ministry, he saw his ministry as a beautiful box, okay? The ministry was a beautiful box that contained the gift of, which was Jesus Christ, okay? It's a beautiful box, but it contained the gift that was Jesus Christ. But then he said that, but as days went by, he said that we began to neglect the box, neglect the gift, and began to focus upon the box, right? We ended up, we wanted to build a bigger box, more beautiful box, a better box. And in the process, we neglected the gift, which was Jesus Christ. That can happen to an individual, that can happen to Christian workers, that it also happen to ministry and to churches. We can do several things, right? Several programs could be launched, but in the midst of that, if the church 
if the church in India, if the Richmond Town Methodist Church, if you would lose your focus upon Jesus Christ, everything we do is futile. Everything we do is bankrupt simply because we have lost our focus. The central message of the gospel is Jesus Christ. There's a group of people, one of my favorite groups of people in the Bible we read in Acts chapter 11. Now, if you notice in Acts 1.8, I think next week you're going to hear more about Acts 1.8. But in Acts 1.8, Jesus said that how the Jesus movement should start from Jerusalem, but it must go to the end of the world. But the early disciples struggled to take the gospel out of the confines of the Jewish people. So when you come to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, there was a huge wave of persecution after the death of Stephen. And Paul or Saul was in the forefront of that persecution. And as the church was scattered, the Bible said they were scattered all over the place to Judea and to Samaria. Interesting, isn't it? Because that was the place where Jesus first asked them to go. But as they congregated in Jerusalem all the time, I think God used even persecution to scatter the church. I often say God used Acts 8.1 to accomplish Acts 1a. Right? Now when persecution is sweeping in various ways in our country, I could see, but even in the midst of some of the most difficult circumstances that God is using to shape the church, to be the church that he wants it to be. There is something good that is coming out of what is going on here. So now these people were scattered. We read in Acts chapter 11 that these people all the way from Jerusalem, now they come to this city called Antioch. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire, almost half a million people. As they come into Antioch, these people from Cyrene and Cyprus and from other places, they began to speak the gospel to the Jews. That was the dominant paradigm of the time. But then we read that but some of them, some of them began to speak the good news to the Gentiles as well. This was the singularly probably the greatest paradigmatic shift that happened in mission history and the gospel was intentionally taken away from the Jews and presented to the Gentiles, to the Greeks as well. But if you notice in that passage, the verse, it says that, that they proclaimed the good news of Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let me give you that, uh, um, that reference. Uh, I think that is and important in Acts 11, okay, in Acts 11, verse 19 onwards, and then in verse 20, it says, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. Humanly speaking, this was not good news at all. It was because of this good news that somebody lost their life. It was because of this good news, these people were scattered out of their homes. It was because of their good news, their career were cut short. Because of this good news, that they were driven as refugees within the Roman Empire. Right? It was because of this good news. Are you with me? Are you with me? It was because of this good news. Lost everything. Right? They lost everything. These are refugees with nothing on them. These are internally displaced people within Roman Empire who have walked 300 miles up from Jerusalem all the way into Antioch. But my dear church this morning, I want you to see what did they share? What did they tell to the Gentiles? What did they tell to the Greeks? They said they shared them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a church. What a group of people, isn't it? The gospel of Jesus Christ will always be the good news. It doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't happen what, matter, what happens to me. But the gospel of Jesus Christ will always be the good news. The day the church comes to grip with that, the day that this truth sinks deep within our souls, then we would be different. We would be like that people. They were the people who changed the course of human history. We would not be worried about what is going on with us. But our singular passion is that this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This morning, my prayer that somehow the Spirit of God would 
take this good news and deeply embed within our souls that you would become passionate about this good news that you would say lord it doesn't matter what happens to me it doesn't matter what happens to my career it doesn't matter what happens to my business this gospel of jesus christ will always remain the good news oh give us few people like that and we will change india Are you excited about the good news of jesus christ apart from this there is no other good news Look at the world around you and me this broken this bleeding world that is looking for good news what is the good news the church has to offer fortunately sometimes you've gone away since it gone away from the ideals of the early church that a peter and a john could say gold and silver i do not have but i give you what i have all i have is jesus christ and that's what i want to give it to you Sometimes today we have gold and silver isn't it where is the power where is the power there are the passionate people who say it doesn't matter what happens to me the gospel of jesus christ will always be good news so the message of the great commission is the incarnate word that is the thrust jesus christ the eternal word becoming a human and dying and rising again and who through the power of the spirit of god transforming us now that is the central message now the methods would change and it must change as the context changes right the methods will change but the message will never change the message will always be the same that is lord jesus christ as this is so crucial i took more time spending on it but i want to quickly highlight the rest three of it before i would close you notice this passage the second thing you you notice about the message of great commission is the first i said the incarnate word and secondly the inspired word the inspired word you notice here what jesus said in verse 45 then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture and then he said this is what is written okay even earlier on the road to emmaus you know they would talk he would talk to them about moses and psalms and from prophets how jesus is the promised messiah in other words the incarnate word because you and i are removed almost 2000 years from when jesus appeared in history in in human form isn't it so how do we know that is true this incarnate word the truth about the incarnate word is faithfully recorded and transmitted to generations through the inspired word okay that's an important component in the message of the great commission how do we know that this is true because this has been recorded this has been inspired by the spirit of god through the original writers of the gospel and is being faithfully transmitted to us i believe that's why the church must be passionate about the inspired word as well right we must stand up for the truth we must defend the word of god at times when so many false teachings and false teachers come around it's imperative for the church to hold on to the word of god there's one of the writers i like uh, a man called leonard ravenhill in one of his books he i think in the book called why revival tarries he says that The word of God is more wounded at the hands of its exponents than at the hands of its opponents. I really like that. You just scan some of the television so-called Christian channels and see what kind of gospel is going out. Often you wonder where is Jesus here? Where is the word? Where is the incarnate word? Where is the inspired word? The church needs to be dedicated needs to be committed to this inspired word to the inspired word because it's the inspired word that faithfully records the truth about the incarnate word jesus himself told the pharisees in john chapter 5 and verse 39 and 40 he said that you diligently search the scriptures because you believe by that you will have eternal life but these very scriptures point to me and yet you refuse to come to me these scriptures point to me that's what jesus was saying incarnate word and the inspired word and the third and the third component you see here is the illuminated word is the illuminated word now this is a 
uh, this is something often we, 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 of course, in our uh, theology classes, uh, we talk about this as illumination. What do we mean by that? This is that, for instance, you have the word of God, you know, that is this Bible that you have. In some sense, it also, when you have it in your hand, it is literally a book, isn't it? It's literally a book with papers and printed stuff in it. But what happens is that, that the Spirit of God takes that, right, and he applies it. And he illumines that word of God to us so that we are able to understand it and apply it, okay? So this incarnate word that is faithfully recorded in the inspired word, and the Spirit of God takes that inspired word and he illumines it to us. He opens it up to us. He interprets it to us. Look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Right? That's the illuminated word. A process by which the spirit of God would open up the scripture and applies it to our hearts. And tells us, hey, this is God's word. You better internalize it. Right? You better internalize it. And that's what we read here. Once you do it, what happens? You become God's witness. Read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I think verse 5 and 6, Paul writes that how, you know, the Lord who said, let there be light, he made his light to shine in our hearts. Illumination, right? So God's word becomes alive. Hebrews 4, 12 says, the word of God is alive and active. How do we believe that? Because the author is alive and active. He takes what has been written some 2,000 years ago and he makes it alive and he illumines it and he brings it to my heart. And you and I as people of God, we need to take that word and we need to internalize it. We need to apply it. We need to live by that. And finally, that happens, right? When you have the incarnate word Jesus who appeared in history, which was faithfully recorded in the inspired word and the spirit of God takes it and illumines it into my heart and as I internalize it, what happens? Number four, the imperative word. The imperative word. You know, the word imperative is, uh, you know, you know it. Uh, One thing it says that it is something of great importance is that it's imperative, something that's very crucial, imperative. But also imperative means a command, Right? Imperative tense, you must do it, right? Imperative also is a command. So when Jesus said, go and make disciples, he was not giving us some suggestion for us to politely consider, but it's a command to be obeyed. Go and make. It's a command. It's in the imperative tense. So when you apply the word of God to your heart, what happens? Then the Lord works in you. And it brings out, you cannot keep that word to you. Like Jeremiah said, my, there is like a fire in my bone when I shut up and when I don't speak the word of God, I feel there is a fire in my bone. It becomes an imperative. I am called to share the gospel, right? We read here that said that gospel must be preached. The forgiveness of sin must be preached, right? That is the human dimension coming in here. Okay. God coming in human form, incarnate word, and then spirit of God moving God's people to record it faithfully and transmit it to us. That is the inspired word. And then the spirit of God takes that very inspired word and applies it to us and helps us to internalize it. That is the illuminated word. And once that happens, what happens? You and I cannot keep quiet. The challenge is to take the word, to proclaim it, and to live it, to articulate it, right? It is articulated both through our lips and through our lives. Let me show you one phrase and then I will be done. Verse 48, Jesus said, you are witnesses of these things, right? You are witnesses. In Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses. Now in the Greek, we get, you know, English, the word martyr, as you may, many of you may know, Marturia, that's where you also get the word in Greek and in English you get the word martyr. So when Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, if you want to translate it you know, more closely to the Greek, you would say, he was saying, you will be my martyrs. So the word witness has got two dimensions. It's a noun, that you are a martyr, and it also has a verb, right? Something you do both through your lips and through your word, right? Through your life. 
that you are witnesses. So this morning, as we come to the conclusion of uh, this morning, uh, you know, meditation, as you look at this passage, right, what is the central thrust? I want you to ask yourself, am I excited about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Am I passionate? Do I truly believe that this is the good news? Do I truly believe this is the good news the world needs to hear? Am I passionate about God's word? It's my prayer this morning. But as we look into these passages, that we would come and say, Lord, I want to truly be a witness for you. Like the men and women who came into Antioch, who lost everything but their faith, but their commitment to you, but their passion for the gospel. Lord, this morning, would you make me that witness? Would I be that witness for you, Lord? Of course, times are changing. Things are becoming difficult. Several years ago, when I was doing my PhD at Asbury Seminary, I was wondering what would I write on my, for my PhD thesis. And the Lord led me to write about this very fundamentalism that is going on today and the persecution of the church. You could see it's happening in various, right at the institutional level, right to the individual level, and at the grassroots level. The question and the challenge for the church. I'm not talking here as individuals only, but I'm also talking as a church. As a church. As a church. Would you hide your lamp? Would you hide your light? Or would you stand up in times like this and say, Lord, not by our own power, as he said here, but by the power of the Spirit of the living God, we as a church would be a witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. Come what may. Let me close with a true story. A story about E. Stanley Jones, the famous Methodist preacher who went on, you know, was a close friend of, uh, of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, who came to India as a great preacher and a missionary. I think it was in 1939, Time magazine put the face of E. Stanley Jones in his cover and they called him as world's greatest missionary. It was E. Stanley Jones. I think he might have even preached here. E. Stanley Jones. But as he was growing up as a young boy, one day his pastor in his church said, uh, uh, Stanley, would you like to preach? You know, young Stanley always wanted to preach. So he said, yes, pastor, I would love to preach. So he meticulously prepared a sermon. I was ready on that day. And, you know, he, uh, he came to preach. He was all prepared and it was a small town. So his family and friends all have gathered there. And he was so excited. He's going to preach his first first sermon in front of his family so he when his time came he walked up you know with a spring in his feet and he was so excited and of course he began to preach he, he was preaching well but as he began to preach you know he said that you know this is uh, written in his autobiography a beautiful autobiography uh, a song of ascent if you uh, get it uh, read it uh, so he says that as he began to preach you know, sometimes we preachers, uh, uh, we get into a problem where our mouth goes ahead of our mind, right? Uh, even in your normal speak, you can get that, right? So it's like that, you know, he was preaching so fast, you know, he said that he used a word that didn't even exist, okay? Uh, so I don't know, the word something like indifferentism or something like that. So he spoke and he, and he used the word. And he saw that, you know, the, 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 the church began to... To, you know, the, that's all his friends, right? They began to smile at the word that he used. And then he writes in his autobiography this. He says that, well, in those young days, I was very conscious of what others thought of me, particularly what young girls thought of me. <laughs> okay. So when he saw this young girl sitting at the front row, she put her hand to her mouth and she chuckled when he pronounced this word. Stanley Jones went blank. Okay. Literally, he went blank in his mind. He stood there trying to recollect his sermon. Nothing was happening. Nothing was coming out. Fortunately, he was a Methodist. If he were a Pentecostal, he could have said a few hallelujahs and you could buy some time, isn't it? Right? <laughs> but, you know, he just stood there, you know, just blankly staring at the people. He had no clue what to say. Then in great shame, he looked at the audience and said, I'm sorry, I have forgotten my sermon. He walked down the pulpit, was about to sit down at the pew. He heard the still small voice of the Spirit saying, Stanley, have I done anything for you? 
He said, yes, Lord, you have changed me. Your word has changed my life. <coughs> then the voice of the Spirit said, why don't you go and share it with the people? So then he again ran back to the pulpit and he said, now you know I cannot preach, but I'm going to share what God has done in my life. That's what being a witness is all about, isn't it? It's to share what God has done. This is what Jesus said. You are my witnesses. You are a witness to these things. And in his autobiography, he brilliantly, brilliantly writes. He says that I had a flawed thinking in my mind. I thought that for Jesus, I must be a lawyer, somebody who would argue so beautifully and convince people. But on that day, the Lord reminded me that I am not called to be a lawyer, but I'm called to be a witness because a lawyer argues from secondhand information, but a witness shares his first-hand experience. Isn't it? A witness shares his first-hand experience. So this morning, that's the calling to you and me. That's the calling to us as a church. Would we be a witness to the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Let's close our eyes and pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we are deeply, deeply conscious of our own failures, of our own moments where you have nudged us where you asked us to be a witness, but Lord, we chose to hide the light. This morning we come before you, Lord. We are a jar of clay, brittle, breakable, fragile, and fallible, Lord. We are nothing but a jar of clay, but we come before you, Lord, this morning as individuals and as a church, we come before you and as a lump of clay, we offer ourselves into the hands of the master potter. And we say, Lord, would you take us and mold us? And would you use us, Lord, for your glory? By the power of the Spirit of God, would you enable us to be your witnesses in such a time as this? Heavenly Father, this morning, give me and us this grace and strength no matter what happens to us Lord no matter what happens to us Lord we would always be excited about the good news of Lord Jesus Christ in Jesus name we pray